Hello, and welcome to Interdependent Study, our podcast where we engage in the learning and unlearning work for collective liberation. I'm Aaron. And I'm Damien. Thank you so much for joining us today. Each week, we'll bring something new to the table and discuss our thoughts and feelings about it through the lenses of who we are and where we can go for a more just society. That's correct, Damien. Thank you. We want Interdependent Study to be a space where we're always learning with one another through positive reinforcement. Yeah. Uh, Damien, you're up this week. <laughs> what are you bringing to the table today? Always something with you. Yeah. Uh, I am bringing a piece from the December 2023 issue of In These Times called The Right is Prepared for This Moment, Are We? Uh, the, yeah, big question. The The piece is a transcript of a conversation with several leaders, scholars, journalists, activists. I'm going to name them all so you know who they are. Jamel Bowie is a podcast host and columnist at The New York Times. And a, a prolific TikToker. That's true. Alex Hahn is a longtime organizer and serves as the current executive director of In These Times. But it was hard to find him. Nancy McLean is a professor and author. Tarso Luis Ramos is the executive director of the social justice think tank called Political Research Associates. And our good friend Olufemi Taiwo is a professor and author. We read his incredible book, Elite Capture. I had to look this up. I thought it was last year, but it was two years ago that we read Elite Capture. Yeah. Uh, it, seems yeah. So, it seems like yesterday, but also apparently it was two years ago. So those are the folks in this conversation. The, the conversation itself is centered around all of their thoughts about the left's role in fighting the right, and particularly in the context of the presidential election that's going to take place this year but also more broadly and in general as well. So I think that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to bring this piece to the podcast, given the year that we're in, this this election is happening this year, whether we're ready for it or not. Yeah, yeah, I guess uh, that's how it works. That's how it works. This conversation that these folks had, I think, is so important because I think the how behind how the left is going to work to counteract and and fight the right is is such a critical thing to for all of us to engage in and figure out mm -hmm. one of the things that nancy mclean says about this imperative because i think that's exactly what it is she says this quote as dangerous as the right was 10 years ago it's infinitely more dangerous now they have captured one of the country's two major parties and turned it against the factual universe and toward authoritarianism mm-hmm and 100% uh, accurate, I think that's a reason alone to take in and engage with this conversation that these yeah. uh, incredible folks have. So I, I very much so enjoyed their conversation. I felt like I got a lot out of this, so I'm, I'm so excited for us to talk about it. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Yeah, I thought it was a really great conversation between uh, all the folks you, you mentioned before. There's some really great insight here that everyone shared, and there's different perspectives too, which yes. I appreciated, thought was great. Yes, it's nice to learn from a variety of people who are not necessarily 100% aligned all the time, yeah. but are aligned in this moment. Yeah, because there, there were moments where they sort of, um, they disagreed with, with yeah. one another, mm -hmm. politely yeah. disagreed. <laughs> yeah, it just and it was adding a different perspective on, on what that, whatever it was that they were talking about in that moment. Yes. So, I, yeah, I thought that was really great. And, you know, I appreciated the introduction to this discussion, all the things that happened after in these times. Uh, decided to create a special issue. So they wrote about that some, and they wrote the special issue dedicated to what the right-wing authoritarians are up to. And so some of the things that they, I think, are addressing now, that we're addressing now, that are happening now, hadn't happened yet when they made that decision or even when they had written and released this. That's right. So they said, quote, Republicans had not yet elected an avowed Christian nationalist as Speaker of the House and... Tennessee hadn't yet watched a mayoral candidate arrive to a candidate forum under the escort of a self-described neo-Nazi. Republicans hadn't made a martyr of the man who strangled to death a homeless person on New York City's F train. Municipal governments weren't proposing to criminalize driving on their roads to obtain abortions out of state. Many fewer books had been banned. Texas hadn't laced the Rio Grande with razor wire and Idaho wasn't hemorrhaging OBGYNs. So all those things are happening. Yes. Or have happened. And yes. so the way that in these times establish the importance of this issue and this discussion specifically, I think is really important to pay attention to because of how much right-wing authoritarians are doing, how fast these things are all coming at us and to us, because as they point out, the right have been planning all of this for decades yes. and they've been putting all of it into motion for 
a really, really long time, you know, w- with a lot of emphasis on the court system, but across all of this stuff. Yeah, it's really been an effort on their part, a well-planned in, in so many ways well executed, unfortunately, effort by the right to do all of these things. And so, yeah, I did. I, I really did appreciate the context that they set before the conversation to say, yeah, we're, we're talking about this. And this felt important given that Trump is still on the ballot for 2024. But look at these other wild uh, things that have right. also taken place. And so this converse, it makes this conversation even more important, I think. And in so many ways, the reason why another reason why this conversation is so important for all the things ways you discuss is that you know the the right is so bold and so dangerous Mm -hmm. and what they are enacting what they're carrying out what they're doing and so yeah that that to me makes their analysis about what's taking place so important to learn from and, and i appreciated that jamel Bowie said this in describing the right and the right's efforts and the work that they've done so quote today's right has a much more explicitly authoritarian orientation than we've previously seen from the mainstream right mm-hmm. it's basically how can we take the administrative state and weaponize it against our political and cultural enemies that's the signal effort of right-wing groups like the heritage foundation with regard to the prospect of a second trump administration mm-hmm. So that's one piece. Alex Hahn shortly after that said, quote, the different alignments that exist inside the right, the openly white nationalist bent, the question around women's bodily autonomy, the attacks on trans youth, all of these things used to be subordinate to whatever the driving force behind the block was, corporatist or Christian right. But all of those things are so nakedly out there right now. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to pull that because like the, just the notion of the use of that phrase nakedly out there, I think is such a, a vivid description, a truthfully vivid description of what's taking place right now. It's just the right is so unapologetically bold in yeah. what it is that they're doing, their actions, their words, the ways that they're describing people and talking about people, the ways in which they're stripping rights from folks, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Jamel says it so beautifully right there, sort of weaponizing the state against anyone and anything that doesn't align with their narrow-minded white supremacist values and beliefs. And so to me, it just, you know, this again reminds me of why this conversation is so important. This was such a worthwhile read. You know, we have to name what it is that we're seeing from the right and what it is that the right is doing to figure out how we put a stop to that authoritarianism and, and fascism that's so rampant, so bold, and so so dangerous right now. Yeah, I loved that analysis from Jamel Bowie yeah. and the way that Tarso Luis Ramos built on it immediately after that when he said, quote, it's also important to recognize there's less standing in their way. Yes. The relative strength of progressive to centrist forces, the hollowing out of Democrats' liberal tradition into neoliberalism, the willingness to make concessions to white supremacy, there's just less in their way. This is true in the international arena as well, with a rising global axis of right-wing authoritarian states and not even the pretense of a counterweight. There is nothing in the international scene to block the United States from going in an increasingly authoritarian direction. And I think this is so spot on to point out how the liberal tradition of the Democrats has eroded over the years. I think we can see that with any number of presidents, but it, it started with Clinton when we start looking at some of the things that Clinton did and the, the ways that he ran on his platform into the very similar economic policies that, that Democrats and Republicans seem to have, the the solutions they see to, to economic problems of everyday person yep. are very similar. And... There aren't as many progressive Democrats grounding the party in a more progressive stance. And you think about all of these right wing abuses of power and of the administrative state. There hasn't been a strong rebuke to any of that over right. the years either. Yep. So there's all of this stuff that's happened that's eroded that the strength of centrist or democratic forces to create this space for the right wing to do what it is 
that they're doing right now. So the strong-willed opposition to the Republican shift toward authoritarianism is is really limited across the Democratic Party, which is you know weakened in so many ways. And there's not much internationally, as he said, to stand up to this shift toward authoritarianism. So I see this both as a call for a strengthening uh, in movement work in, in inside the U.S. to respond to this, yeah. but also a call for international movement solidarity against authoritarian shifts in governments across the world, mm. because it's not just happening here. It's, it's right. following a pattern of things all across the all across the West. Oh, that's some great analysis of what is happening here and what they were talking about in this conversation. I like that. Um, we absolutely need this sort of international solidarity as uh, well, right? But uh, you know, it's hard. It's it's hard because it's it's easy to get <laughs> to see what's happening here and mm-hmm. to be so consumed by that. But and I think there's a lot of power and insight in looking more broadly and seeing what's happening across the globe. Yeah, that, it, it just makes me think about how there's so much incredible insight <laughs> in this conversation. And I think it means we won't be able to talk about all of it. But one of the things I definitely wanted to talk about was their conversation about what a broad front to fight the right would and should look like. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that Alex Hahn shared was this, quote, It's hard to learn lessons from local politics, but I think the Chicago mayor's race was the first time an electoral coalition was led by left institutions particularly the Chicago Teachers Union, but an array of others that took on leadership. I really don't think there's another example in a modern American history. So it's a question of whether of where does infrastructure exist to create a winning coalition. And then just a little bit later on, he goes on to say, quote, we need a real power analysis. What are the institutional forces in our political space that can actually lead? The excitement in and around the labor movement goes unstated a lot of the time. But the question isn't whether a particular contract fight or organizing campaign will win. The subtext is, can these institutions and groupings build enough power to help build a bigger movement that can actually provide meaningful structural gains? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I appreciated the fact that he called out and gave props to the Chicago Teachers Union role in, in Chicago's mayoral race. But I think more importantly, his thoughts on how we build power to fight the right are so important. How do we build coalitions at the local level? How how do we take advantage of and, and learn from the victories, and in some cases the defeats as well, at the local political level or in labor movements and, and apply them to our larger movements, mm-hmm. our, our national work? I think there's a lot to learn from that coalition building work and, and ways to channel that energy that can fuel the larger fight against the right. That's part of the takeaway from that for Mm -hmm. me. Yeah. I think that that's so important to think about how, what are, what, what exists and what can we build from what exists? Yes. And, and looking at it from, from both things and building coalitions based on what exists, but also beyond what exists currently. Absolutely. So Olufemi Taiwo says something in here that we've heard him say in other discussions like this. I think we read something from Hammer and Hope where he said something similar to this, but it bears repeating because I think it's a key reason why the right wing's ideas have such traction now. So he says, there are a lot of failures of analysis on the left and they don't do us any favors when we're thinking strategically about which political movements to link within mass movement politics. But I also wonder if our problem is even more basic than that, just a sheer imbalance of practical capacity. The National Furry Convention (laughs) is an order of magnitude larger than the DSA Convention. There's not a lot of us. Mm -hmm. We represent the people that don't have the money, and we don't have a shadowy cabal of billionaires to make up for the lack of majority alignment with our views in the way the right makes up for it with dollars. We need a practical answer to that. The right has a whole ecosystem of talk radio. We have great publications like this one, but I'd love to see the readership and viewership of orgs like In These Times, an order of magnitude larger than it is. To get there, we have to find a posture toward the center left that is something other than disdain. As wrong as they may be on the issues, but more centrally, we need a set of communication and recruitment infrastructures that can compete with the right. So I love this analysis yes. because we have a ton of commentators online from the left and across different publications, but there isn't always a concerted effort to connect these folks together into yes. a network of contributors, or there isn't always a, an organization that can absorb 
energy from people and absorb people into opportunities for action in the way that I think the right is easily able to figure it out or the right isn't asking for it right. either. So, yes. Yes. you know, the way that you get involved in the right is entirely different because um, <laughs> they don't actually want you to be involved and the left would love for you to be involved. And yeah. So anyway, you know, I'd love to see some real support and marketing dollars available to these places like in these times or the forge or hammer and hope yes. and the radical publishers. We read books from frequently like Haymarket and Verso and AK press because we need more eyeballs on these ideas and more people engaging with these ideas for reform and liberation and revolution. And when these things are also, when these things have more eyeballs on them, when yes. these ideas are engaged with more frequently, there are generally more avenues for involvement in the movements that are supported by these ideas. And so you see a sort of reciprocal relationship there. And I think that that is important for us to figure out how to build to fight the right, as Alex Hahn was talking about. I love that analysis. And I think you're right. And one of the other things it makes me think of is that, you know, we need more ears listening to this here podcast of ours, too. So if you're listening yeah. right now, tell your friends about it. So, you know, we can amplify these great organizations and, and publications that you just just mentioned mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, yeah rate rate and review that's that's apparently what will get more ears on on the show that's what we've that's, been told yeah absolutely <laughs> well this feels like a good place to shift our conversation over to application though really all of this has been application <laughs> yeah, seriously but let's talk about how this piece and what we've learned from uh, the incredible conversation that these folks had and how we can apply it to our everyday lives and work the final thoughts in this piece were shared by Alex Hahn in response to the question, how should we think about the rights claims of a political realignment and that they now represent the working class? Mm. And I thought Alex's response to that question not only was just a great response, but it was also some really poignant application of the entire larger conversation in this piece. And to me, it served as a reminder of what we need to do moving forward. So Alex says this, quote, we've seen how a multiracial, multigender populism of the left could exist. Part of the issue is our ability to define what that populism looks like and not just as a cosplay, two dimensional version of it. At moments like the 2020 racial justice uprising, we've seen glimmers of it or in this year strikes by auto workers, healthcare workers, screenwriters, actors, and so many others, or in the campaigns to save abortion rights in states like Kansas and Ohio. These give shape to the kind of populism we need to win. We are the majority, and those who seek to take away our rights are the elite minority. Mm. And we need to express ourselves as a majoritarian project in order to win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, I think there's so much in that analysis that is a clear takeaway from the, again, the entire conversation in this piece. When, when we can come together, see and understand our shared and collective humanity and, and advocate and fight for liberating solutions and justice for all, I, I truly think there will be nothing that can stand in the way of, of creating this world that, I, you know, I hope and I know that we all need and and deserve and so to yep. me that those closing remarks were, were really powerful yeah that quote from alex Hahn was one of the key pieces of application here i think in the whole like it's it's at the end or toward the end and kind of wraps up the whole thing yes that quote also reminds me of how uh, pissed off i get <laughs> when we talk about populism being this right-wing thing and i'm like well only in this context yes like yeah all of the ideas that the left has are actually popular with people. It's just they've hijacked all of it to not play by the rules of yes. the game. Like, and they're very all, loud and you know in yeah. your face about it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You're mm -hmm. right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, loud and wrong. Loud is and what wrong. They are. And and yeah. they don't care. They just keep it moving. And I always tell you, my grandmother would say, "Don't be loud and wrong." Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> and they're doing both. They're doing both. <laughs> oh, extra boy. loud and yes. extra wrong. Good lord. Okay, but I think the solidarity that he's talking about here is one of the things that we're beginning to see more of, as he mentions, and keeping it going is what's important. Yes. Right before Alex Hahn said that quote that you mentioned, Nancy McLean said, 
quote, we're seeing a new iteration of something old, which is all about attacking reforms that would make the country a more egalitarian place. And nothing about supporting workers or attacking corporations, except now the attacks on some corporations for supporting environmental or diversity programs. Mm. But it's gotten more traction with white people of different classes and even some Latinos because of the years of neoliberal policy that shattered the labor movement and the role that unions had in insulting not all, but many white men for embracing this kind of politics. The more we recognize this as having very deep roots, the better off we'll be. Mm. I think that's something that's really important for us to take into account when we're responding to the right and blocking the right, because this current moment is grounded in all the reactionary right-wing nonsense that they've been doing for centuries. Yes. And so what does it look like for us to actually move beyond this kind of thinking? How do we reckon with our history collectively and the ways that white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist patriarchy has operated in this country since its founding with the Foot soldiers, a lot of that being the right wing authoritarians who have been sprinkled throughout history. And I, I really appreciate Nancy mentioning how important it is to ground the current moment in that history, because I think that history provides us maybe a roadmap for a response. Absolutely. Yeah, she really brought, provides a brilliant analysis and, and application of all of this mm -hmm. as well. So I think I think those pieces work well in tandem together. So, yeah, that's great. All right, well, let's talk about homework now. What do we want to do to continue our learning once we, once you push stop recording mm -hmm. on that computer over there of yours? Oh, we didn't steal it. Now people are thinking we stole it because I said it. Um, <laughs> I Maybe so, I did. Maybe you did. I didn't. No, you did. I, <laughs> I, I'm positive that I probably said this when we read a lead capture back in 2022, but mm -hmm. I, I definitely want to read Olufemi Taiwo's other book, Reconsidering Reparations. Yep. Um, I'd also like to read Nancy McLean's book, Democracy and Change which also sounds really exciting and oh, there would be yeah. so much to learn from. So I think that means our book list just continues to grow. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, what else can I expect? Yes. And reading this also just made me more excited to go back to the December 2023 issue of In These Times magazine that this piece, this conversation was featured in. And I don't know that we read anything else from that piece. So, and I certainly didn't. So I'd love to check out what else is featured in it. Yep. Yeah, that's my homework is I want to read more articles from this issue. There looks like there's some great stuff in here about all the things the right wing is doing. There's stuff on all the anti-trans legislation and rhetoric that they call and label hysteria. They talk about how the right wing's persecution of supporters of Palestine looks a lot like the Red Scare and the attacks on public schools and how queer Louisianans are fighting book bans and winning. Mm -hmm. And lots of other insight into what the right looks like now and what they're doing and what they're planning to do and, and all of that stuff. So I think it, it looks like a really fascinating thing to get an inside look at the kind of work that they're doing and, and the kind of, mm, I guess, society they're trying to move us to. Absolutely. And it reminds me of how you set us up when we started talking about this uh, conversation of mm. how there's – more things have happened since the release so of this many. edition, this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from that issue. So yeah, we'll definitely check it out. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. All right, my friend. Well, you're up next time. What are you bringing to the table in our next episode? I'm bringing a special issue of In These Times magazine. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I was like, really? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> um, no, I'm bringing a report from Jen Forward and the Movement for Black Lives called Perspectives on Community Safety from Black America. Oh, wow. This was released toward the end of last year, so it's a, a couple months old now, but the Movement for Black Lives organization has been doing some webinars and other events to talk about the report and share results. The report is designed to show a wide perspective of responses, and this is a quote I pulled from the executive summary that kicks off the whole thing. The results highlight an alarming reality. Police are often feared by black communities in crisis and emergency situations, and a large majority of respondents report that they or someone they know have had negative interactions with the police. The data underscore that these fears are not unfounded, as more than three quarters of the respondents perceive police killings of black people as a broader systemic issue. Nevertheless, a majority of black Americans also say they would turn to the police for help, perhaps because of a lack of concrete alternatives. Mm -hmm. Throughout our findings, black people in the U.S. consistently expressed a lack of trust and confidence in the police. Black Americans also support comprehensive reforms and new initiatives meant to enhance public safety. 
So I'm looking forward to learning more from this and talking about it right here next week because I think it's going to be a fascinating look at what a lot of different kinds of people are considering to be public safety and how that how that concept of public safety can be expanded. Yeah, this looks incredible. This is I didn't know this is what you were going to bring next week, so I just clicked on the link and opened it. And um, just the notion of this idea that black people don't trust the police, but also don't have an alternative at times, mm-hmm. right? And don't know what to do and sort of that that dissonance that exists there yeah. um, is fascinating to me. And, you know, it's certainly our hope, my hope, our hope that, you know, one day we do have something that is different and better than what we have now. And yeah. that is, in fact, true public safety for all. So I'm so excited about this and looking forward yeah. to, to reading it and learning from it. So thanks for finding it. I'm yeah. excited about it. Thanks to Movement for Black Lives for sending me an email. Yeah, very good. Oh, I'm, I must have missed that. Very good. All right. Well, with that, we want to thank you for joining us today. You know what we're going to ask you to do here. But in case you forgot, please follow, leave a rating and review, share our podcast with everyone you know, follow us on the socials, including TikTok and Instagram. We just released a really some great TikToks this week. Check us out on YouTube and sign up for our email list to get notified about any new things we've got going on behind the scenes. Yes, thank you so much for listening. And remember, it's not about us, but it is about all of us. And we'll talk to you next week.